afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce Susan Sarandon. She's not just uh, a prolific uh, actress who, who is, has won multiple Oscar nominations and has won an Oscar for her role in Dead Man Walking. Uh, her film, Thelma and Louise, was part of my syllabus as a student of uh, film and mass communication. I actually had to not just watch it, but write a whole paper on it. That so, so that's the kind of influence you have all across uh, the world, right here in India as well. But there's so much more, uh, Susan, uh, than what we see on screen. I think so many of us are so interested in you because beyond your acting, you're interesting, you're outspoken, you're rebellious, you're extremely political, and you even like ping pong. And I think that combination <laughs> is pretty rare. So ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for a big welcome. Thank you. I want to start by asking you something from the Indian perspective of what happens to women in cinema here. And we find that women in Indian cinema tend to have an extremely short shelf life. Literally every few years you have a kind of recycling. There are a few women who manage to stay on in what we call here alternative roles. So not mainline, but alternative roles. Somehow when we look west, we find people like yourselves, people like Meryl Streep, seem to have defined that. How difficult is it to be a woman in Hollywood? Well, I think it's been recently that careers have been longer. Um, when I started out in 1970, um, you, you talked out at about 40. And so I think part of what's happened is that there are more um, women who are creating their own projects. And uh, it's true that as you get older, a lot of the roles are supporting roles. Mm -hmm unless you're dying or helping someone else die. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that's one phase I'm trying to phase out of because I, I had quite a few films that, uh, that were like that. But I think part of, part of what helps is if you're a character actor. I always saw myself uh, not as an ingenue, even though I started when I was 20, but um, as a person who was interested in doing a lot of different roles than the person I am. And so I think it's harder if you're um, uh, an ingenue or a leading lady that isn't very versatile. There, in, in the business, I think there are some people who um, have very strong personalities. And so they play themselves over and over, men and women. I mean, Bruce Willis is in, do a lot of different kinds of parts, you know, um, whereas somebody like Al Pacino would, or Meryl Streep does a lot of different type of parts. But some of the women that uh, were young women when I started haven't made the transition. Um, and so sometimes it's easier to start when you're in your late 20s or 30. And but I, I think it's just, uh, you know, there certainly are more male roles and men get paid a lot more, but they're not necessarily good parts. Hmm. So I don't know if we they're want more, to play They're more stereotypical parts. From yeah, the and, and, and because the studios are run by men. But what's interesting is that women buy more tickets. And uh, people that are older buy more tickets. So um, they're starting to understand to gear a little bit towards that. But I think mostly now women are creating their own projects. Would, would, would you see it's a discriminatory space, the, the, the film industry, towards women? Is it discriminatory? Is oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Um, it's a male driven, male, uh, and now more bank driven. I mean, uh, in the early days of cinema, they had personalities who took chances on films as the studios. Now it's very much run, you know, they check to see how many followers you have on Twitter. And if they're casting things there, uh, doing a lot of surveys. And uh, it's, it's a rare studio person who will take the chance to uh, get behind something because people try to keep their jobs by never having to say yes. They, you know, they say no as much as possible. And so it's very rare when something will come out of the studio system that is unusual. 
They, that's why you have so many movies that are number two, three, four, or five of the same franchise. It's mostly, uh, I think a lot of money is made with franchises now. The media has often described you as somebody who's played strong women on screen, but you've contested that narrative by saying that, okay, maybe in hindsight they seem strong, but when you were actually playing out these, these roles, they didn't seem particularly strong. They were women who just were driven by circumstances or had to do what they, what they had to do. And in Thelma and Louise, you actually, uh, I think, described your character as somebody who may have actually been on the verge of a breakdown. So do you, do you find this labeling of Susan Sarandon plays strong women slightly problematic? Well, it makes me feel stronger. <laughs> um, I I don't find it problematic. I just think that it's it's interesting in hindsight. You can look back and think, oh, Sister Helen, for instance, who I know personally. You know what a strong personality, how um, principled she was. But in fact, each step of the way was so difficult. And I I find it more interesting to play ordinary people who end up making a decision. Uh, there was a time when when that came between you and presenting the awards. So was there ever a conflict for you? What, what is the Oscar to you? I think it, you know, it's hard enough in the business without awarding things to some people and not to other people. And, um, but at the same time, it's a very select club to be in. You know, I was saying the other day, uh, if they had to say five-time Oscar loser, <laughs> it's, it would feel bad. Yeah, I, I don't know, you know, because that's basically what it is when you're nominated, and it is an honor to be nominated because there's so many wonderful performances. So I would be lying if I said that it doesn't mean something to to have an Oscar and to get awards from other countries also, but then part of your brain knows that you've been very lucky. I mean, I found the book, Dead Man Walking, and I gave it to Tim, who did a brilliant job of making it into a movie. But, uh, you know, so I got a shot at that part, which was a wonderful part. But other, there are other women that could have done as good a job, maybe a little bit different than I did it, but I would have done a, a very good job with that. And so you kind of know in your mind that um, it's subjective and it's lucky. It depends what else is nominated. I think by that time, I had had five nominations so close together. People were just, get it over with, let her win, just stop this. And you know, finally. And that's why sometimes you see people getting nominations, I mean, winning the Oscar for something that maybe isn't even their best work. I think that happened with Al Pacino, where he'd been nominated a number of times, and then uh, the, the year that he won wasn't necessarily even the role that you remember him with. But so it's it's a mixed bag, but certainly it's you know you can't sell the Oscar. Hmm. Would, would did you ever consider? Did you ever consider selling it? Well, well some, some people have sold. But did you consider? No, it? but if you give it to your children, you even have when you when I first um, got a nomination. Uh, they hadn't started making you sign this piece of paper that says that you won't sell it and that you'll give it to the Academy for a dollar if you die or something. And so every year I was nominated, I didn't sign it. And then I got the Oscar and I still hadn't signed it. And then they said a few years later, uh, we want to clean your Oscar. So <laughs> stupidly, I gave it to them to clean and they said, okay, now if you want it back, you have to sign that paper. <laughs> Um, because Michael Todd Jr., remember Around the World in 80 Days? Yeah. His son had a number of children, and he needed money. And he sold his Oscar, and they got very angry, and that's when they started this whole thing. Because it's crazy. I mean, you can, you can sell a menorah. I mean, you can sell religious things. You can't sell the Oscar. It's crazy. Now, you have been known for your outspoken political views. You took a position against the war in Iraq, for example. You've taken strong political positions within your own country. This is, by the way, very rare uh, uh, in the Indian experience because we don't actually see our film industry representatives taking political positions at all. And we often wonder why they don't and why they can't. But I have to ask you, because you're so political, how would you uh, assess Barack Obama looking at 
Snowden, snooping, NSA, what's happened in Libya, what's happened in Syria. Do you think he deserves well, a Nobel? Well, let me say that it's not that common anymore in the United States either to be outspoken because it's been so harsh on people who have asked questions in the major areas. And because there's um, very powerful hate jocks, we call them, on the radio. And so um, you risk a lot to ask questions now in the United States, more than it used to be. And I can say also that um, when outside of the United States, here for instance, you ask many more political questions than you know, when, um, when you're doing what they call a junket for a movie in the United States, it would be all about who you're sleeping with or what you can, your children are doing. I mean, it's, they never touch on, uh, hardly ever touch on anything political, so it's very unusual. But um, how would I rate Obama? Um, I think Obama, when Obama was elected the first time, and, and in both times, uh, definitely whatever the Republican choice was, would have been a disaster. So, I mean, I voted for Obama and I'm very happy that he was elected. Um, he accomplished a lot by being an African American who was elected president. I mean, I think the rest of the world thought we'd lost our minds after two times with Bush. And I mean, the second time I was in Spain or somewhere, and people were like, what is going on? I understand the first time was a mistake, but seriously, what is going on there? So I think it was a very hopeful sign when the American people, against all odds, uh, elected uh, an African-American. I mean, it was just so recently that we had slavery, so that was a huge thing. And I think that his family is great and she's great. He's certainly, um, the healthcare thing is good. Uh, he has prosecuted more whistleblowers than all the other presidents put together. So his uh, record on civil liberties is not great. And um, I, my expectations for him based on his record in the past and his association with insurance agencies and nuclear energy and a lot of other things I didn't have the high expectations that some people did. Um, I think that he was amazing to activate so many disenfranchised people. And my youngest son is still getting emails from the, you know, he, he wrote a, a, I want to say something to you, Miles. It says this, you know, like first person. So finally the other day my son wrote Obama back and said, you know, I'm really surprised that you want to say it to me in person, you seem so busy. <laughs> I didn't know you really had time. Um, I think that, you know, it. I, I don't want to go through, this is the only thing that we'll get in the paper, whatever I say now. <laughs> go straight to the United States. Um, I, I don't think it's, a secret that a lot of people are disappointed. Um, as I said, I, I didn't have high, high expectations in certain areas. Um, and I'm even more disappointed in the Democratic Party and, and the Senate and the House. I mean... Do you think he deserved the Nobel? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's blunt. No. I want to know if uh, being an actor has ever come in the way or the glamour associated with it has come in the way of you being a good human being at a personal level? I think that to be a good actor, you have to be a good listener. You have to have imagination. Once you have imagination, you have empathy. And so that's the very first step towards activism of any kind. I think that being an actor and being able to play different people, you realize that everybody's afraid of the same thing, everybody needs the same thing, and the rest are just details. So it's almost an enforced compassion. I live in New York. It's not very glamorous in New York, so I haven't had to deal with the glamour of Hollywood. Um, I think it's a great um, job to raise a family because um, you know, you work very hard, and certain times you can take your kids. My kids, I just brought them everywhere. 
Um, so that way, you know, you don't have to choose between a career and a family, at least not anymore. I think if, uh, ages ago you did, but you don't now. So I think if anything, if you put aside being completely self-centered and narcissistic and don't go in that direction, um, it can make you a better person because I think, um, as I said, it connects you to everyone and, and the more imagination comes in, the richer your world is. Okay, let's go to the back. I, I, I don't have that much time. But right in the last row, there where I've seen two hands up, just anybody there. I don't know if we gave you a mic. The back, please. No, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Is there someone there under the mic? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Sabir. Ask a question. But let the person ask a question. I ask a question. You should wrestle. Why are you shouting? Let the person in the back ask a question. You got a mic. Please sit down. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Um, my name is Sameer. Uh, I'm an actor as well. Um, I have actually two questions for you. Um, the first one was, have you ever had to struggle with uh, something known as emotional memory? Because, I mean, as an actor, I've had, um, it's been really hard uh, for happy and, uh, and crying, especially on stage. You know, crying on stage and instantly laughing on stage. Um, it's, it's quite, uh, I don't know, I, I thought it would be easy, but it's not. So, um, has, have you ever had a role which is played on you and stuck on for months uh, or something of that sort? with emotional memory. Well, the worst thing is when you get a script and it says she bursts into tears. <laughs> because then every time you get to that place, you think, oh my God, am I going to burst? Am I going to burst? So I think you put so much pressure on yourself when you know those things are, are coming that makes it difficult, especially on stage. So I think you have to be able to sometimes fake it. You can't expect all the time, especially on stage. I don't like to use you know, thoughts of my children dying or anything. To, I don't like to use personal memories. I'm too superstitious. Um, sometimes I find physically, I can, when I'm doing a film, I can kind of physically walk and get myself into a state. And then sometimes it works to try not to cry. Um, you know, to be fighting against it and then you'll find that it happens, but I think everybody finds their own thing. In terms of laughing, if I have to laugh, I made the mistake in White Palace of being drunk and laughing in a scene, and then I had to laugh for two days, and it was horrifying. Um, and I find sometimes when I just make a, a, you know, a ridiculous sound laughing, then it really makes me laugh. When I hear myself laughing, ah, then I say, oh, that's ridiculous. When I laugh actually, um, but to do anything in a sustained way, certainly in a film when you have to do it all day long, is very difficult. But I, I think physically sometimes you just have to find your own way. And probably because you're worrying about it, it's going to make you more tense. Like if it's cold, it's, oh, if you have to cry, you have to drink a lot of water. No, I'm serious, because you dehydrate. I drank gallons of water during Dead Man Walking, just gallons. Uh, you know, because you can't cry if you're dehydrated. And if you look at Sean Penn in that movie, he's crying and never has any tears. I don't know why that is, but he never makes tears. So I think each person has to kind of try to find their own... But you know, under... When people are happy and when people are really sad, sometimes they do things other than laugh and cry. So you might try to figure out alternatives because maybe there's a more interesting choice than actually crying. Because sometimes guys don't want to cry. Am I not right? I'm a huge fan. I need information. The one question I need to ask, I've loved all your work. What, which is that role in which you put the most of yourself and which is the one that is satisfied you the most and giving you back what you want to put in and uh, how did it save you? Um, 
I don't know which one I have the most of me really yet. Um, I think your sense of humor and, you know, I don't feel like I'm playing myself in any of the ones that I've done. I can answer the second question easily because of Dead Man Walking, finding the book, developing it, having that responsibility, and because there were so many ways for that to go wrong. And also, <laughs> I really wanted Sean Penn. I couldn't imagine anyone else but Sean who could be that scary and that vulnerable and have that hairdo. <laughs> um, but I had to really surrender to that part because basically I just go around saying, I'm so sorry, let us pray. And he gets all the flashy stuff, you know? So I had to really not try to have an act off with him and try to compete with him because, and because I had this huge responsibility with Sister Helen, representing her, who by that time I knew quite well, uh, who I loved very much, and this whole love story that was, for me, the story of unconditional love, and if a person can love someone unconditionally. And so I had to really put aside my ego and just surrender and pray every day when I went to the set to do that, really. So when that came out, and thanks to Oprah putting it on her show, it was a huge hit, because we didn't expect it to, uh, we thought it would go straight to the Nobody wanted to make it, you know, the guy's eyes, there's no love sex in it. This was, nobody wanted that movie. So when the people found that movie and made it a hit, it was so rewarding because now Sister Helen was speaking to thousands of people. And the whole dialogue about, the, about violence and about you know, the death sentence and capital punishment, um, it started this huge discourse. And so many people who had lost um, relatives violently to murder or something found it very healing. So for me, that was the most rewarding, the fact that um, I had found the book. She had trusted me with the book. We just, she just gave it to me on a handshake. You know, there was no, it was done so outside the box. And then it turned into, you know, over a $100 million film. And now there's a play, and so it's in high schools, and it's in, you know, in different countries, and the folks saw it, and the folks, a few folks have done nothing, because they'll not be able to come before. So for me, that was the most rewarding for those, for those reasons. Thank you so much. That is, uh, I'm really happy with that answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're completely out of time. If we have 15 minutes past the time. We'll just have to, we'll just have to end here. My motivation with my career. Oh, that has, she lost the person. She lost the person. Come on. Um, honestly, I just wanted to get out of New Jersey. <laughs> and um, I fell into the business. I Someone needed someone to audition, and I went with them, and they saw me, and they said, why don't you come back? I came back, and I was in New York for five days, and... I got a job in a movie that ended up being huge, and they just explained to me what they wanted me to do, and I did it, and the first thing I had to do in the movie, I supposedly was on drugs, and I had to trash, just, you know, throw things all over in the store. And after I did that, I thought, oh, this is fabulous. I, this is so much fun. I mean, why, I could have, that be fun. And then I got another movie, and then I got on a soap opera, and then I started kind of understanding what I was doing, and, and after a number of years, I thought, oh my god, I guess this is what I do. I paid off, I went to four years of college, I paid off my school debt, and I thought, you know, I get to travel, I get to meet interesting people, this is the best ever. And, and then I just realized, I guess, that's what I do. So I wasn't really motivated to be an actor. I wanted to go to college. I loved literature, I loved films, um, but I got hooked when I started doing it because it, it feels like you can never get it completely right. You know, every time I see myself, I think, Jesus, I knew what I was doing. Why didn't I do it more convincing? Why wasn't I braver? Why was I, ah, you know, and it's still that way. So I don't think you ever feel um, bored. 
and you are constantly, as I said to her, you know, exposed to so many different people that you get to play in one lifetime, and uh, and you're always kind of testing yourself, and um, and it makes I think it, if you're really good, it makes you a better listener, and I think that it it in order to be really good, you have to learn to put aside your own ego, which is not an easy thing. So you can spend your whole lifetime trying to, you know, try to get to that point where you can be more humble and, and appreciate what you have in common with everyone. All right, at that point, I have to thank you. I have to, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Thank you.